Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for the release of two National Research Council reports, Climate Intervention, Carbon Dioxide Removal and Reliable Sequestration, and Climate Intervention, Reflecting Sunlight to Cool Earth. These reports are now available online at www.nationalacademies.org. Today's event will last approximately one hour. After some opening remarks, the committee members here with us today will discuss the report's findings and recommendations, and then we'll open the floor for questions. When asking a question, please identify yourself by name and affiliation, and those watching on the web can submit their questions through the form at the bottom of the video player. You can also follow the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag climate intervention. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce the president of the National Academy of Sciences, Ralph Cicerone. Thank you and good morning. <coughs> Welcome to the National Academy of Sciences and this event to re release these two reports, which we hope will be very important. They're very well thought out, I think. Uh, those of you who are unfamiliar with the National Research Council, it's basically the operating arm of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, so that's why the, the tag on the report is National Research Council. Altogether, we've been studying climate change and reviewing progress, for example, since the late 1970s. In fact, about a year ago, we released a joint report, a short one, uh, which we hope was easily understandable by readers in all fields, along with the Royal Society in London. And it was mostly to explain the clear evidence that climate is changing. That was preceded by a similar National Research Council report on the risks of abrupt climate change a, a couple of years ago. And in 2011, we released a really major series called America's Climate Choices, uh, which discusses options for limiting greenhouse gas emissions and for mitigating and adapting to the effects of climate change. Throughout, in virtually all of these reports, the message has been clear, and the message has been generated by uh, experts in the field over the years. That is, that the most effective and least risky way to fight climate change is to reduce worldwide emissions of greenhouse gases. And please make no mistake, that is the, very much the case today. And these, these reports make it clear, I think. However, as we all know, the world is not yet on a clear path towards major reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. And the longer that pattern continues, the larger and perhaps more severe the consequences of climate change are likely to be. Those realizations have forced scientists to at least consider what has become known as geoengineering or the use of technologies to reduce the size of climate change in the future. These climate interventions, as our study committee now calls them, and about which you'll hear more in just a moment, are designed either to remove carbon dioxide and potentially other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, or to increase the ability of the Earth and or clouds to reflect sunlight energy away from the planet through what's called albedo modification. Albedo is basically reflectivity. The questions of whether or even to study climate intervention technologies, uh, in particular the more risky albedo modification options, has caused controversy among scientists for decades now. And many scientists are concerned that this research will somehow divert policymakers and the public from what should be their main focus, namely to reduce emissions. Well, today's reports also do not distract from that focus. They make it very clear. However, every year of inaction on the emissions reduction front does increase the likelihood of demands for technological solutions to avoid potentially devastating effects of climate change in the more distant future. Therefore, the scientific community needs to have answers and a much better understanding of the consequences, both positive and negative, of ever deploying these intervention strategies. 
So toward that end, the distinguished committee that dis conducted this study thoroughly examined what is known about the science behind these climate intervention technologies. Because carbon dioxide removal and albedo modification options are so very different in terms of risks, research needs, costs, and potential impacts, the study committee separated its findings and recommendations into two separate reports, the covers of which are shown on the screen. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Both of these reports provide a scientific foundation to inform discussion amongst policymakers and the public about these issues. They also should guide federal agencies in supporting research on climate intervention technologies while keeping separate any decision making about their implementation. Uh, we're all very appreciative to the entire committee for its very thoughtful and careful and insightful work over a period of many months now. And our study director, Dr. Ed Dunley, and all of the staff who contributed to producing these reports also deserve our appreciation. Now I'll, I'll introduce the committee members and let them take charge and get this going. First of all, Dr. Marcia McNutt, the chair of the committee and a National Academy of Sciences member in her own right, is also editor of Science Magazine and until recently directed the entire United States Geological Survey. Dr. Walid Abdullahi is professor of geography and director of the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences series at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, Dr. Scott Doney is senior scientist and chair of the Department of Marine Chemistry and Geochemistry at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Don't ask him how he got out of Woods Hole uh, <laughs> with the weather. And Dr. David Titley is director of the Center for Solutions to Weather and Climate Risk at Pennsylvania State University. And he's also a retired Rear Admiral of the United States Navy. And now Dr. McNutt will provide a brief overview of the committee's findings and recommendations. Marcia. So thank you very much, Ralph, for um, giving a context for this study. As you've already heard, the committee didn't begin with the notion that we would be writing two reports, but as we discussed this topic, we decided that the progress on either topic was not being furthered by conflating the two topics of carbon dioxide removal and albedo modification, otherwise known as solar radiation management. And that is the reason for dividing the two. Uh, what we determined was that carbon dioxide removal is relatively low risk, but slow acting, uh, expensive at the moment, and difficult to scale, and therefore it had challenges of its own. Whereas albedo modification is, uh, has unknown risks and known risks that are substantial, but could be very effective and work quickly, and therefore had other challenges of its own. And because um, these are very um, complementary in terms of uh, what is um, known and unknown about the two, they really need to be separated both in the minds of the public and in terms of the research needs, hence the two reports. We also decided to abandon the term geoengineering. We aren't talking about geo, we're talking about climate. We also felt that engineering applied a level of control that is illusory. Intervention is an action that is meant to improve, and that is what we are talking about. In intervention, we don't always know exactly what will become of it, and that's indeed uh, what might happen. You intervene and you hope something will improve, but you can't exactly predict what the outcome is, and that is probably a better uh, reflection of what happens with these interventions. It's not engineering with a precise outcome. Okay, so um, the context for this. 
I don't have to tell this group that the signs of a changing climate are all around us. Long-term records of greenhouse gas uh, increasing, sea level rising, ice sheets and glaciers are melting. Um, so the climate change uh, impacts cascade from ecosystems uh, to people uh, to the economy, and the National Academy has uh, put out a number of influential reports on this topic. Um, possible climate response options are, of course, uh, number one um, options are mitigation and adaptation. But the question that was asked of our group is, can climate intervention be another arrow in our quiver? And what would be the risks? What are the opportunities? So um, we were supported by a number of agencies listed here in alphabetical order uh, in order to uh, study this topic. We were to do a technical assessment of two classes of climate intervention technologies, hence the two reports, one on removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that gets fundamentally at the cause of climate change by reducing carbon dioxide and thus, in a sense, dialing back climate to um, a prior state. The other is uh, reducing climate absorbed by Earth by reflecting it, and um, thus just uh, reducing some of the impacts, but not, but not in any way getting at the root cause. So what is currently known um, using science to look at the risks and consequences and looking at the viability for implementation by looking at some of the costs and um, looking at some of the technical um, uh, implementation. Uh, we had to identify future research needed and comment generally on the potential societal, legal, and ethical considerations. That was our task. Uh, here's our full committee. We had 16 members uh, which were chosen for their expertise on the topic and their balance in perspectives. We held four meetings and interacted with dozens of scientists uh, who briefed us. Reports were viewed by 16 outside experts and the report went through the usual academy's rigorous uh, review and uh, approval process, including being signed off by Dr. Cicerone himself who is an expert in many of these uh, topics. Here is our number one recommendation. Our number one recommendation is after looking at both carbon dioxide removal and albedo modification, there is no silver bullet here. We cannot continue to release carbon dioxide and hope to clean it up later. We cannot continue to alter climate and think we're just going to reflect sunlight and uh, cool ourselves off that way. Our efforts to address climate change should continue to focus most heavily on mitigating greenhouse gas emissions in combination with adaptation to the impacts of climate change, because these approaches do not present poorly defined and poorly quantified risks and are at a greater state of technological readiness. We have these at hand. We need to be using them. Climate intervention is riskier and more expensive and slower. So these are uh, mitigation and adaptation should be used right now. Now let's look at the first report on carbon dioxide removal and reliable sequestration. There are two classes of approaches we looked at. The first was enhancing natural carbon sinks by changing uh, land use management, such as reforestation and afforestation, or agricultural practices, such as uh, low-till agriculture, to uh, enhance um, uh, soil carbon, or accelerating weathering, um, which is ultimately where uh, carbon uh, will be stored in uh, minerals. We could accelerate that process through chemical reactions to form carbonate and silicate uh, minerals. Or um, uh, more uh, risky approach is ocean iron fertilization by adding iron to the ocean uh, to boost the growth of phytoplanktons. That's the ocean equivalent of uh, number one. Um, by uh, pumping the or priming the pump for the um, uh, natural um, uptake of carbon in the ocean. 
Um, a second class of uh, carbon dioxide removal is a more industrial approach, which is direct air capture and sequestration called DAX, which is a chemical scrubbing process. Or alternatively, bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration called BEX, which uses plants uh, to, to uh, take the CO2 out of the air and then uses uh, carbon capture or carbon dioxide um, capture from uh, the air in the um, waste stream from a power plant and sequesters it underground in the same way that uh, that's done from, say, a, um, uh, a coal um, power plant. Uh, but instead of burning coal, you uh, burn the plants. So um, all of these uh, processes uh, we uh, looked at and um, suggested that um, these are basically slow processes. They take um, many decades to have an impact. Right now, they need um, more research in order to scale up, to look at what sort of materials processing um, can be done better, uh, bring costs down. Most of these are in pilot project stage, but with more investment, these can be improved. They are generally, with the exception of perhaps ocean iron fertilization, at low risk, and we suggest that these can use a more concerted investment. So recommendation number two, we recommend research and investment to improve methods of carbon dioxide removal and disposal at scales that matter to minimize energy and materials consumption, identify and quantify risks, lower costs, and develop reliable sequestration and modeling. Let's turn to the albedo modification report. Um, this reduces the amount of sunlight absorbed by Earth in order to cool the planet's surface quickly. Elsewhere, this is referred to as solar radiation management. We didn't like the term management. Management, again, implies that we are actually controlling things more than is possible. We think we can modify the amount of sunlight being reflected, but managing it, again, is more control than is probably possible. We considered two strategies, stratospheric aerosols, which is very similar to what is done naturally by volcanic eruptions, which gives us some confidence that this technique actually works. Pinatubo cooled the planet by some measurable amount for uh, a few years. Um, or marine cloud brightening, which actually increases the reflectance of clouds um, in uh, coastal areas, usually over the ocean, and therefore uh, increases the sunlight reflected to space and can um, affect uh, some amount of cooling. We also looked uh, briefly at other techniques such as uh, space mirrors, uh, white roofs, other things which were either viewed as too expensive or uh, of such modest um, uh, impact that uh, it wasn't going to make a big difference. Um, our recommendation number three is that albedo modification at scales sufficient to alter climate should not be deployed at this time. And our reason for recommending that is that we felt that albedo modification poses significant risks. The risks were both known and poorly known. Known risks are, for example, decreases in stratospheric errors, uh, ozone, changes in the amount and patterns of precipitation. It doesn't get at the root cause of climate change uh, because it doesn't reduce greenhouse gases. It doesn't affect things such as uh, ocean acidification, which is a huge concern. There's poorly understood regional variability. You can't control what's going to happen um, average the planet will cool, but you can't uh, control, for example, that there might be warming in the Arctic and cooling elsewhere. Um, and there's a potential risk of millennial dependence um, that uh, once you start it, you uh, have to um, maintain it for a very long time. And if you look at millennial dependence, what institutions have we been able to maintain on this earth for millennial um, scales? Um, maybe the Vatican, but is the Vatican going to maintain um, albedo modification? I don't think so. All right. Um, we 
did have this recommendation number four, uh, an albedo modification research program um, that emphasizes multi-benefits research that further a basic understanding of the climate system and its human dimensions, such as the social, the political, the ethical, the economic impacts of albedo modification, because we felt if there were ever a climate emergency, um, could this be part of a portfolio of responses, or if a um, independent actor decided to um, affect an albedo modification, and our leaders needed to know what's going on, is this a problem, how does the U.S. need to respond to someone else uh, implementing albedo modification, we would need to have answers. So the committee felt that the need for information at this point outweighs um, the uh, uh, need for um, uh, shoving this uh, topic under the carpet. In terms of um, uh, albedo modification research, we felt that current observational capabilities lack sufficient capacity to detect and monitor environmental effects of albedo modification deployment, whether it's a natural effect say from uh, a volcanic eruption that we might want to study to learn more about albedo modification, or um, a purposeful event from uh, an uncoordinated actor. Um, and particularly, uh, we need long-term records so that we understand natural variability in um, albedo and in um, radiative forcing and associated changes in climate. And so we recommend uh, the sorts of proposed uh, climate sensors that would help in this regard. We also felt that it's more than just science involved in decisions on research and, de and uh, deployment. There needs to be governance and ethical and legal considerations. Um, we felt that albedo modification research is not specifically addressed by any existing federal laws or regulations, and we want transparent, inclusive, and open conversations. The goal of governance should be to maximize benefits of research and also show that that research is uh, designed to minimize future risks. So one of our important uh, recommendations is that, the, that there be the initiation of a serious deliberative process to examine what types of research governance beyond those that already exist may be needed for albedo modification research and the types of research that would be required um, uh, that would require such governance, potentially based on the magnitude of their expected impact on radiative forcing, their potential for detrimental um, direct and indirect effects, and other considerations. So that while we're recommending a research program, we feel the research should be uh, subject to this governance, and the governance should be open, transparent, and um, not involve just scientists, but should involve civil society as well. So in conclusion, the challenges of climate change require a portfolio of actions with varying degrees of risk and efficacy. There's no substitute for mitigation and adaptation. That's what we should be doing now. Carbon dioxide removal strategies offer the potential to decrease carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, but they're limited right now by their slow response, by their um, inability to scale up, and by their high cost. Albedo modification strategies um, have the ability to work quickly, but they're currently limited by unfamiliar and unquantifiable risks and by um, governance issues. Any intervention in Earth's climate should be informed by a far more substantive body of scientific research than is available at present. We would not want difficult decisions to be made in an information vacuum. So finally, we would like to acknowledge our sponsors, um, for this important report, um, all of our fellow committee members, the many reviewers who put a substantial amount of time into improving the report, our excellent um, NRC staff, including Ed Dunley, who did a great job with this, numerous colleagues that we consulted with during the study, and here are some um, uh, additional um, uh, 
uh, places to go for more information uh, on this report and other um, resources on climate. And finally, I'll just leave up here during the Q&A um, one of the tables from the report that we believe nicely summarizes why there are two reports and the very complementary nature of carbon dioxide removal proposals and albedo modification proposals. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. McNutt. Um, so now we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, for people in the room, there are two microphones. Uh, please go to those. Um, and for those on the web, if you weren't listening right at the beginning, there's a form right underneath the video player where you can type and submit your question that way. Uh, please do identify yourself by name and affiliation when submitting a question. First question, please. <coughs> yes, Seth Bornstein, the Associated Press. Uh, for Scott and David, um, if you can address the, uh, the idea that you know, 10, 15 years ago, the you know, National Academy wouldn't even be, want to study climate geoengineering, what does that tell us about sort of the situation we are in or heading in? Is it uh, an indication of desperation or fear that we will be soon desperate? Um, yeah, th thanks. Thanks, Seth. For the, uh, for the question there. I, I think what it shows is really a maturation of the ability for the uh, scientific community writ large to think through really all possibilities, even if they're very, very distasteful. And I think Dr. McNutt made a, and Dr. Cicerone uh, made a compelling case that, that uh, we do not recommend the deployment of albedo modification at this time. Uh, and we believe, after looking at everything, that mitigation is still what we must be doing. Uh, we, we are, you could see if you look back through, say, history, uh, this is kind of on a trajectory of from the 2009 Royal Society study, which I think many, many in the room are probably familiar with. Uh, we had almost 50% new science to look at that has come uh, in the, to the peer-reviewed research since 2009 when the Royal Society put out their report. Uh, I think we have been very clear in our terminology. Uh, climate intervention, vice geoengineering, albedo modification, vice solar radiation management. Uh, two reports, very, very different classes of climate intervention. But all of that really shows a maturation of, of really where, where we are going. But at the end of the day, we still believe that mitigation is what we should be doing. Thanks. And just to follow up for any of you, for Dr. McNutt especially, if you're, you do talk about the concept of outdoor small-scale tests with, civil with some kind of governance, would you like to give us any idea of how that would happen and more importantly how soon would you see I mean David Keith had a uh, study I think in some uh, philosophical transactions recently um, where he's proposing it just a one kilogram test um, how soon do you expect to see some small-scale albedo modify you know albedo uh, modification tests Well, what I would hope would happen from this report is some uh, immediate follow-up, uh, perhaps that might be um, triggered by um, the agencies that sponsor this, that might be sponsoring the research, that could help um, uh, initiate the uh, discussion of how to put together this governance process, figure out who the stakeholders would be, and help convene um, a group to discuss that might include NGOs, that might include um, other uh, external groups that could be representatives of civil society. 
Um, I've used, for example, um, the group that oversees gain-of-function um, studies in biology uh, for um, uh, analysis of uh, H1N5 uh, as an example, um, and that if uh, that can get going fairly quickly, that would be sort of the rate limiting factor, I think. So we have a couple questions from the web, um, and that's a, a follow up to Seth's question. Um, should the governance regime for albedo modification research be developed before any field research or alongside it? Uh, this is Walid Abdullahi. I think um, while they go hand in hand, the first step needs to be understanding how you would treat such research. So I wouldn't say the the governance regime, uh, as it will ultimately emerge, needs to be established before any first steps are taken. I think a framework, though, that that addresses what kinds of activities would require such governance is a necessary first step. Um, and once that first step is taken, I think the two can evolve simultaneously with governance slightly ahead of, well, I guess it's not simultaneous, but with governance slightly ahead of the actions themselves. And you know, there are some mechanisms in place that are currently applicable, but what the committee um, had decided was when you're talking about albedo modification, it's such a a foreign beast as compared to the kinds of things that, that we currently undertake, that it really does need some kind of structure that looks at not simply the physical and ecological ramifications, but the human ramifications as well. So while the structure can emerge uh, alongside the research, certainly the first step has to be understanding what kind of structure is needed before any research is undertaken. So in our report, if you uh, go all the way back to the appendix in uh, appendices in uh, the albedo modification, we actually have a history of weather modification. So not, not climate, but weather. And as an example of when experiments, operational experiments, get out ahead of a governance structure, uh, I think we can look in this country to Project Storm Fury. So I, and many in here probably know the story. Uh, there was a cloud seeding program underway to try to reduce the strength or impact of hurricanes. Uh, the, in the 1960s, the U.S. government seeded a hurricane. It made an unforecast and somewhat climatologically unusual uh, turn right into Savannah, Georgia. Uh, needless to say, there were a lot of people who put one and one together and got three. Uh, it turns out that uh, many of the modeling studies done decades later show that the seeding probably did not, in fact, have an impact on the turn. But without a governance structure, uh, people put this together, and needless to say, that was the last time that we have, uh, we have seeded hurricanes anywhere, well, we have seeded hurricanes. So, so getting the governance, as Waleed mentioned, slightly ahead of operational uh, experiments is, is probably the right way to go. Please go to the microphone. I'm uh, Mike McCracken from the Climate Institute. I, I guess what I don't get a sense of from your discussion is that you've done a comparative analysis of climate change without climate intervention and climate change with climate intervention. I don't get the impression that you're looking at the seriousness of the situation of climate change and the path we're on and how little is going on. So I, but I'm also, I guess, surprised by use of the word should in a scientific report, I, I'm, I might say, because I think that gets to a, lo a lot of other things. But what I wanted to ask is, um, given some more research, and we agree some more research is needed, um, what what are the enormous uncertainties that are, be, but that's a quote, I think, or enormous, yeah, enormous uncertainties and risks that um, are involved in solar radiation management kinds of things that involve keeping the climate roughly where we are as opposed to the uncertainties associated with where we're headed without 
climate intervention up to two or three or four degrees C above the present. I might say that it seems to me there actually are some analogs out there that would suggest that the dangers aren't really that great. Uh, this current supposed climate hiatus that, that we have where it's not rising so much um, may well have a part that is caused by volcanic eruptions, if you accept the papers of Ben Santer and others. Nobody even notices that, that volcanoes are sort of keeping the climate change from rising. The idea of waiting till there's an emergency and doing it seems to me just not going to work. I, I, I guess I'm wondering if you considered sort of a gradual implementation and then this issue of relative uncertainties in a comparative analysis. Mike, do you analysis. have a question? Yeah. Could, could you state your question, please? Did you do a comparative analysis of climate change with and without intervention? And, wh and what are the risks of, of the okay. climate okay. intervention? Thank you. Okay, let me, let me start on that and then I'll pass it on to Waleed. Um, here's the issue. First of all, what climate will be in the future is still uncertain because the trajectories are um, highly speculative because it's still in our hands. We don't know what the future emissions will exactly be. There's the business as usual scenario, which takes us on one path. There uh, is the aggressive uh, emissions reduction scenario that takes us on another path. There are, um, and, and exactly what um, the Earth's conditions will be under those emission scenarios is also um, not exactly known. So you're asking us to make a prediction that um, we cannot exactly do. If you're asking, are there models that then look at um, albedo modification under these various emission scenarios, yes, there are. And I will pass on to Walid to tell you what they tell us about some of the predictions of those models if we got into the um, habit of trying to control climate through albedo modification um, by um, uh, using that as our solution. So I guess rather than specifically address what you had, had teed up, I think I will, uh, in a more general sense, say this really boils down to risk of not intervening with the climate versus risk of intervening with the climate. There is a huge body of research currently underway to assess the risks of not intervening with the climate. It's not cast as such. It's, it's climate change research in the various um, RC, the representative concentration pathway scenarios that were in the IPCC report. So climate change research is progressing and, and the models uh, are, are developed and, and run under different assumptions. So if we weigh the risk of not intervening versus the risk of intervening, we're, we're working hard on one piece of that the trajectory we're currently on or the various trajectories we could be on depending on the actions taken. What we don't have is a good understanding of the risks of intervening. We have a qualitative sense that it is a major perturbation. Um, and so I come back to the first recommendation, mitigate and adapt. But in the absence of uh, sufficient action in, on those fronts, the next would I would summarize, understand. And that's really what we're after. And, and the other thing I'll repeat that I said in my um, uh, introduction to this is that we also understand from what we know of albedo modification is that it only cools on average the planet. There are regional variations which are not controlled. So that uh, as an example, it may um, on average cool such that um, Kansas is happy with the answer, but um, 
the Congo may not be happy at all with the answer because of the changes in rainfall. And um, uh, Australia may not be happy at all with the answer. And it may be actually quite a bit worse for the Arctic. And it's not going to address at all ocean acidification. So there are all sorts of reasons why one may not view the albedo modified world as an improvement. So as a follow-up to uh, Bruce Parker, Assistance Climate Lobby volunteer, so as a follow-up to that, assuming that we're not able to you know, bend down the curve of our CO2 emissions, and it looks like in the relatively near future we would have to say, you know, albedo modification looks like a really, might, might, we might have to do that. Is there any disadvantage from delaying like 5 or 10, 15 years after a decision is made that looks like it's reasonable to do? Are there any advantages to say, hey, if we need to start doing it, the sooner we start, the better? Or, if we lay, or can we delay, that act, delay the actual implementation by, by, you know, by a decade or so and, uh, and not, not have really more serious consequences? I, I would say the sooner we understand, the better. Um, and that understanding will inform what actions are or are not taken. And the point is today we don't have enough understanding to really get our hands around that, that trade-off. Um, Eli Kintish, Science Magazine. Um, I thought it was telling that the research agencies of the U.S. government didn't request this study. It was the CIA who did, and then the research, uh, research agencies were brought on later. Do you think now that this report has called for uh, federal support of geoengineering research that we'll see funding for such studies um, f of, of both carbon dioxide removal and albedo modification? I would say the research agencies are going to weigh this, uh, recommend our recommendations with all the other um, elements they need to contend with and support and do their own assessments as to how this fits into their uh, their portfolio and their their research plan. So this is a call. It's uh, another source of information. I can speak most closely to NASA where I have the most experience and, and that research portfolio is guided by the decadal survey. So it's reasonable to think that this may feed into the decadal survey deliberations which will begin before too long. But it's, it's one element of a broader portfolio that needs to be weighed against all the other competing needs and interests. I'd also say that um, the Department of Energy, which is a supporter of this study, um, has been uh, a, quite um, uh, very uh, supportive of carbon dioxide removal. And it is quite squarely in uh, their bailiwick to um, be um, uh, a proponent of this type of research. And I think that uh, the committee is very hopeful that a report uh, like this one will give them a lot of support to um, to give them um, a lot of support to be aggressive in uh, evaluating these technologies. So that's that's our hope anyway. So I, I'm sorry. I'd like to also add one more thing. The recommendations, uh, particularly in albedo modification are for multiple benefit research. So the kinds of things we seek to understand in the context of climate intervention have direct relevance for our understanding of atmospheric and climate and oceanographic processes. So they're not, it's not really an either or, it's, uh, it's an and. Yeah. And just very quickly to add on to Waleed's comment there, if you dig into the body of the report, we further recommend under this uh, research and development, uh, particularly for albedo modification, but not exclusively, that the U.S. Uh, Global uh, Climate Change Research Program, or USGCRP, uh, have a role in this. As I think many in the room know, uh, USGCRP already works as a coordinating body across federal agencies to uh, make sure we're maximizing the, the use of, of those uh, precious uh, research dollars, uh, given that much of the research we 
think can be uh, used for, for further fundamental understanding of, uh, of some of the climate dynamics, uh, we think it makes sense for UC, USGCRP uh, to have a strong role in coordinating uh, whatever federal uh, R&D is, uh, is undertaken. Hi, I'm Kelly Wanzer from the Marine Cloud Brightening Project. Uh, and this is a project that's looking at um, early experimental research in clouds and aerosols over the ocean. Um, and my question regarding the report um, with regarding to cloud albedo in particular was whether the committee considered the um, influence of anthropogenic albedo being produced by emissions currently. So in other words, amongst the atmospheric scientists that I know, um, it's, it's commonly thought that we are already producing significant cooling from anthropogenic emissions brightening low-lying clouds, um, and specifically from coal-fired plants, ships, and other uh, types of emissions of, of that kind. So in a sense, we would be engaged in inadvertent climate intervention, if you like, or producing some cooling effect already that we don't fully understand. Um, and I wondered if that was part of the discussion going into the, re the report. Well, we have a, a figure um, in the report that actually uh, shows that, um, yeah, showing the, the ship tracks and, and the brightening from that, of course, um, driving ships around, burning um, bunker fuel to brighten clouds to cool the planet, certainly, um, to me anyway, does not sound like a winning proposition. Oh, um, well, I, I, I want to oh. clarify, um, because I, I didn't make the comment as um, a, a, any kind of support. Um, simply from a research perspective, um, if we're producing forcing in this way, that, that the understanding of the fundamental process, not, not that we want to encourage it. There, there, there is a substantial body of research underway looking at particular sulfate aerosols, but also black carbon aerosols, other human-driven aerosols in the troposphere, uh, and their impact particularly on regional cooling. This has been incorporated into uh, the IPCC documents, for example. Um, the approaches that are being suggested for marine cloud brightening are somewhat different and there are many issues of the, the behavior of small particles in the atmosphere, how it interacts with water and clouds, which would be some of the recommendations for the research if you were to actually want to move forward on marine cloud brightening. Um, but there are complementarities, and this is the mutual benefit, where the work, um, if, to move, if it were to move forward on marine cloud brightening, would also help inform uh, the underlying physics that's part of understanding, you know, albedo, uh, effects that are already going on. And the figure Marsha was referring to is on page 86 of the Albedo Report. Hi, yes. My name is Daniel Richter with the Citizens Climate Lobby. I had a question uh, about how far the committee chose to extend their, uh, their directive to comment generally on potential societal, legal, and ethical considerations. Did you go so far as to comment on policy approaches uh, that might help make your recommendations a reality. I'll, I'll start, and, and I'm sure other committee members uh, may, may chime in there. Uh, we realized that the committee makeup, as was shown in here and is in the volumes, is primarily from the scientific community. Uh, some of us are former bureaucrats, Marsha, Waleed, myself, uh, but by and large, we're really from the science community. Uh, I think the scientific community recognizes well that this is a much broader discussion than just science. Science must be at the table, in our view, uh, but it's not exclusively science. We must also have legal, ethical, uh, the political leadership, uh, because we have to come to something that first our society, and our, our report is really written for the United States, but ultimately this needs to go beyond, beyond the United States. We did not... Uh, want to either prejudge or, or sort of assume that 16 scientists were going to come up with the policy governance 
But what we do very strongly recommend is that serious deliberative process be initiated so that with broad buy-in and transparency and trust and credibility, we can come up with, we collectively, society, will come up with, with an appropriate governance mechanism. I'll let and, I, and I just want to clarify, I mean, we were really looking at the governance mechanism for a research Pardon program me. that would provide the information that society could then use at some point. But we, we you know, the, the discussions of who would make a decision for deployment were outside the scope of our yes. committee. Yeah. That's not Seth Bornstein again from AP. Um, is there, given that uh, in Copenhagen in 2009, the governments declared that two degrees warming was dangerous warming, um, is there a point at which albedo modification becomes um, more palatable given all its potential effects because you've passed some kind of red line. Um, is, there, uh, is it two degrees C since uh, pre-industrial? Is it three? And given, and I, want, uh, and I think, Wally, you, you didn't quite answer this earlier from someone else, given that albedo modification technically would work, wouldn't it work rather quickly? Is it the type that you could then, once you pass that line, it's you, know, you use it to dial back, be below the line. Is that sort of what you could use? So, Seth, I would say that assessment can't be made without the information we're recommending be acquired. So we're not in a position to say, yes, when you hit two degrees, it's time. Throw the switch. Um, we can't say whether that's three degrees, one degree, or never, because we don't have that, that uh, good and understanding of the implications of that action. Um, you did mention effectively throwing a switch to dial it back. Uh, something that's that's critical to keep in mind is um, it's hard to unthrow that switch. You you throw it and uh, you know once you embark on a, on an albedo modification um, approach, if you walk back from it. You essentially, um, you stop masking the effects of the climate change and you unleash the accumulated effects rather abruptly. Uh, you know, the other thing is, as, as Waleed said, you know, albedo modification is masking the effects of rising greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And one of the things we found is that, you know, both from proposed mitigation policies or approaches and also carbon dioxide removal and sequestration, those act slowly. And part of the discussion for why recommendation two of moving forward on carbon dioxide uh, removal and sequestration is that they do act slowly. If you want to start drawing carbon dioxide back down, you wouldn't want to implement an albedo modification without also complementarily working on mitigation and carbon dioxide removal. Because otherwise, you're, you're, you're stuck with this unstable balance of elevated carbon dioxide and an ongoing albedo modification. Okay. Just very quickly to, to, to bring out a couple other, other things on this is, is, is ultimately this is risk management. I, I don't think in the real world that senior policymakers are just going to hit an arbitrary threshold and throw a switch, as you put it. It's a risk. Uh, it's a risk decision. So you need to understand which bad versus known, bad versus unknown, which, which one. And it's probably a least bad decision. The other part which you mentioned is albedo modification going backwards. It doesn't go backwards. It goes different. It goes different. And we don't even understand quite where that different state ends up. If you want to roll things backwards, that's carbon dioxide removal and sequestration. Uh, if you want to go to a different climate, that's albedo modification. And I think that's important to remember. Yeah, what I'd also say, Seth, is that from, you know, perhaps this is an overly jaded view, um, but from what I can see of decision making um, from most leaders, it is rarely 
um, based on some uh, long-term thoughtful process, it is usually in response to a crisis. So I don't think it is anticipating two degrees or three degrees or four degrees, and so they carefully plan for it. It is more likely to be in response to some crisis. Um, two degrees of, or uh, two or three years of rice failure, or uh, two or three years of the wheat crop um, failing um, in an entire continent, or um, massive, um, uh, wildfires everywhere that uh, wipe out um, uh, half a continent, something like that, that is much more likely to trigger decisions like this that, as I concluded in my talk, um, do we want those decisions to be knee-jerk reactions or do we want them to be made uh, with a wealth of information <coughs> about what that um, unknown is that they're going into with albedo modification. One quick question and then a follow-up. Cloud seeding and albedo are the same thing, correct? Do you not consider them the same cloud, thing? Cloud seeding produces an albedo response, but I would not equate them. Okay, so are we all saying that cloud seeding is not happening right now? That's, that's not what we're saying. Okay. There, there is whether, and, and it's all written up in the appendix on weather modification. Uh, and we talk about uh, both in the United States and in other countries, local level for like specific fields, crops, airfields, cloud seeding uh, is going on with, with varying degrees of regulation. But that's weather modification and that's not what we're talking about today. And I understand that, but How can we, from my understanding, it's totally unregulated. Totally unregulated. Like any citizen can do it. I've seen uh, ads for $100,000 for a rain-free wedding day. Is that not, I, I mean, is that not? Save your money. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it for 75. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean, all joking aside, I mean, I see cloud seeing the same as albedo. And, and I, it's, you might, it not technically, maybe not be, but it's the same effect, okay? And so what I guess I'm under, trying to understand is. So, so, so imagine, you know, cloud seeding is a local temporary phenomenon. Maybe to carry that to a, a global application on scales that, that are difficult to imagine at the moment. Um, in a sustained way to the point where we substantively, substantive, substantively perturb the radiative balance of the planet is very different than affecting the weather in a region. And, and I guess what I'm saying though is that even if we do it on a global scale or a local scale, we don't know the impacts, no matter if it's cloud seeding or this other thing that you guys are talking about today, it, it, it's, there's, n there's no difference between the two because we don't know the effects of what happens from we, them. We don't know the effects, but the effects of a global undertaking can be far more consequential than the effects of a local undertaking. Yeah. And the effects of a local undertaking generally fall on those who undertake it. And that's an important difference. Cl cloud, cloud seeding has been done for decades and decades with frankly no discernible effect. So in that sense, we do know something about cloud seeding that, that there's really uh, very hard to prove that it actually has an effect, although I'll happily take your $100,000. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so in that sense, we do know something about cloud seeding, but we're talking about climate intervention, which is very different on very different scales, both time and space. Just the last thing, though, there's no regulation on it currently, correct? Uh, re read the appendix. We talk about there are a variety of regulations in different states uh, that talk about the the uh, talk about the the regulations that do exist. So we we have if you would if you could, sir, just go through that, and and we've actually uh, have kind of written it up. Every everything. Question, we'll take the next question. question over here, please. Sorry, we're almost out of time. Uh, I, as I listen, I, I'm Rafe Pomerantz. There's a, there appears a common element to all the major recommendations, including uh, the need to massively reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. 
carbon dioxide removal and albedo modification, which my question is, my sense is what the U.S. government needs to do is, is hugely ramp up the R&D across the board on all the portfolio of measures that you're suggesting that need to be part of our climate strategy. We're underinvesting in R&D for carbon-free technologies. We have virtually no investment compared to the need in carbon dioxide removal and basically zero in albedo modification, at least conscious investment. So isn't, I mean, if I'm a policymaker, I conclude across the board we've got to ramp up the R&D. It's a trivial cost compared to the consequences of climate change and it might move forward our ability to control all the trajectories. So I, I think you're talking about R&D that affects all aspects of climate change, both addressing it through an intervention and uh, developing alternative technologies and ways to facilitate mitigation. And, you know, I, I don't want to simply sit here and judge more and more and you need this much, but I will say those kinds of investments uh, are necessary steps in successfully meeting the challenge of climate change. I, I think uh, probably many people in this room know, I call it an iconic view of uh, the non-defense uh, research and development monies the United States has spent over the past 50, 60 years. Uh, AAAS puts this out. It's pretty easy to find on the web. You can see when we decided where we had national priorities. You can watch the race to the moon and you see the R&D in space. You could see the first energy crisis in the early 70s in there. Uh, I would argue you know, I'm not sure that I see the spending in there. So our report says mitigation and adaptation are the first things we should be doing. Uh, you can argue that that would argue for, for in fact, adequate funding. So I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. We'll quickly take these last two questions. Hi, yeah, Steve Gibb with Chemical and Engineering News. Um, what CDR methods have the fewest barriers to scaling up? So some of them, we, we, we divide in the report into the two areas. One is enhancing natural sinks, and the other is technological approaches where the sequestration, because it's carbon dioxide removal and reliable sequestration. The industrial approaches involve geological sequestration into, for example, um, uh, depleted oil or gas um, reserves, underground reserves. Um, when we're looking at the scaling up, and we have some detailed tables in the report that talk about that, some of the geological sequestration approaches, either the direct air capture or the bioenergy um, linked with carbon sequestration, have the most chance of scaling up because you're, not, you're, you're putting the carbon in a, it deep underground in a geological reservoir versus trying to put it into, for example, uh, forests or soils or into the, the, the ocean, which has um, a capacity, but perhaps not as large as the geological sequestration. The other thing is important with the scaling is the rate at which you could take it up. And I would recommend take a close look at the, the, the table, and I can point that out to you um, exactly which table later on. Uh, Eli from Science. Um, this is a question for Admiral Titley. Uh, there's a lot of concern about the fastest warming place on Earth, the Arctic. Um, could uh, albedo modification techniques cool a specific place on the planet like the Arctic? Yeah, Eli, thanks, thanks for the question. I'll also ask Wally to, to answer because he's really the expert here of the four of us on the specifics of albedo modification. But we actually talk about this in the, uh, in the report and Again, the risks are very are very high, and and we did not, I think, find any uh, body of peer-reviewed evidence that said, well, I just want to cool a certain place, and that's where the effects will stay. Uh, and in fact, our our report talks about some sort of counterintuitive uh, kind of kind of effects. At least we've seen from using the uh, vol volcanoes as a as a proxy in which due to uh, the, inter the interaction between the uh, stratosphere and the troposphere, you actually, which is a lower atmosphere, you, you end up with uh, counterintuitively, as Dr. McNuck mentioned, uh, warmer Arctic sometimes after, you, after the first time that you uh, have a volcano. So we did not find evidence that uh, 
if you just say restricted albedo modification to above a certain latitude, for example, you would just cool the Arctic. Uh, it would be it would be nice if we did, but we did not. So I'll I'll ask Wally to. Uh, the, the only thing I'll um, add is uh, for a large fraction of the time there is no sunlight in the Arctic, so the the modifications local effects would be pretty limited. And when there is sunlight, it's generally at a low angle, so the implications of uh, I, adapting this, adopting this as an approach for the Arctic uh, would actually have less immediate effects or less substantial effects in, uh, in a lower latitude region. We have a few more questions from the web. Um, the committee talked a lot about research governance for albedo modification um, and, and research uh, of albedo modification that would also uh, contribute to climate science. So could you elaborate on that as it relates to the first report for carbon dioxide removal in terms of research governance um, and additional research governance gaps and implementation pathways in carbon cycle science research to advance research in climate change intervention? Uh, I, I don't think that whoever sent that question should be conflating the two um, reports. That. Um, the recommendation for governance was for albedo modification. That's the question. Is is does it? Did you also um, okay. talk right. about that with respect to the first report? There, there are um, potential ecological and environmental and societal impacts of carbon uh, removal and sequestration. Uh, we did address some of those in the report. So, for example, a fairly detailed discussion on uh, the e potential ecological effects of iron fertilization and some of the uh, national and international regulations that are currently uh, controlling some of that research. Uh, for sequestration, uh, the challenges are not unique to carbon dioxide removal. They're also connected to carbon capture and sequestration. And some of these issues are related to seismicity that might be induced by injecting CO2 underground. Uh, the, regula the regulatory framework for that isn't as uh, broadly well agreed on, but it's a much more local and regional impact versus the governance issues that are associated with albedo modification, which quickly take on an international flavor. So we certainly would recommend that any carbon dioxide rem removal and sequestration that moves forward that there is a that it's done within a regulatory framework but just the governance issues are are different in part because of the scale uh, uh, the, the, the spatial scale of the impacts except for of course iron fertilization which is somewhat intermediate between the two and and we recognize that this was um part of the challenge of dividing the two reports was that there wasn't always a clean division. So in terms of experiments, has albedo modification actually been tried anywhere? Um, and if so, what were the results? And have experiments been conducted on adding iron to the ocean? Again, if so, what were the results? Yeah, you can do the iron if you want. OK, sure. Um, well, the only um, scaled uh, albedo modification experiments have been natural ones from volcanoes. There have also been the EPIECE experiment that was a uh, cloud brightening experiment. And uh, that one is described in the report that was uh, looking actually more at um, the um, prospect of how would one uh, artificially brighten marine clouds and what would be the delivery method? So um, a quick comment on the volcanic eruptions. A, a recommendation we haven't talked much about is the uh, need for an observational capability to understand the radiative, um, the radiative characteristics. Um, and I think uh, when you ask the question, what is the outcome, it really, it really takes, uh, took a little scrambling in the case of Mount Pinatubo to kind of play catch up and understand what the implications of this major perturbation to the, to the system is. So I really want to take this 
as an opportunity to highlight the importance of being in a position to observe and understand natural occurring phenomenon as well as those we, we may choose to introduce in the future. Uh, and so I can address the ocean fertilization question. Uh, there have been about a dozen uh, research experiments that have involved ocean fertilization, primarily with most of them with iron, some of them with other nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. They have been on a relatively small scale, so uh, fertilizing a patch of the ocean maybe 50 miles by 50 miles. Uh, and they've also been driven primarily by scientific questions, so they were not done uh, to really assess the, the long-term effect on uptake of carbon dioxide and long-term sequestration. Um, we, ha we just haven't moved forward on that. There have been many discussions within the scientific community on this topic, and this also comes under the purview of both the London Convention and the London Protocol and the UN Biological Diversity Convention. Uh, so right now there is some discussion at the international level of how you would move forward on research uh, and whether you would want to move forward on research mm -hmm. uh, to look at this as a carbon dioxide removal mechanism rather than as a scientific uh, tool to really probe how plankton function in the Earth system. So I'd, I'd just like to follow up on Waleed's comment on the monitoring system and one kind of put a plug in for, for that recommendation, our recommendation number, number four there. Uh, another component in addition to the basic scientific understanding, better understanding of, of these processes. Five. Say again? Five. 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 Okay. I can't count. Uh, so the, it, Marcia kind of mentioned, you know, in the, in the real world, you know, we don't react to these nice pre-planned uh, triggers, but rather crises. So another potential uh, crisis you could imagine, or at least challenge, would be, let's say, if a, another actor, an uncoordinated actor, let's say, deployed an albedo modification technique. Uh, one of the questions that would likely be asked at very senior levels of leadership is, so what does this mean? And how do you know? Uh, without an appropriate monitoring system, it's very, very difficult to do attribution and to do the impacts and to do that understanding. So in addition to the basic scientific uh, better understanding, uh, you can think of this as a component of how would you do monitoring for attribution and detection. And it is recommendation number five. My apology. One final question. Uh, do you think climate intervention of some sort is inevitable as a resolution to climate change? I would say climate intervention uh, has occurred and is part of a cause of climate change, um, whether it's inadvertently, right, whether it's uh, inevitable in the future. Uh, it really remains to this be one. seen. I think, so, yeah, 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 I think this one is. So I'm an albedo-centric kind yeah. of person. <laughs> I, 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 I hope that this one uh, will be used. Reforestation, afforestation, uh, better soil management. I think those are um, what we should be doing, what we have to be doing, what we can be doing. I hope we use more bioenergy and um, don't let the carbon back out into the system. I hope we all will be doing that. This one, gosh, I hope not. <laughs> I, I would say the choice is still ours. The choice is still ours. Okay, that's a great note to end on. So that will conclude our event for today. Thank you again for coming. Thank you everyone on the web for joining. Uh, again, you can find the reports at www.nationalacademies.org or at any of these um, locations. Thank you.